My name is Megan Mulder, and I am a Special Elections Librarian here at C. Smith Rollins Library. Um, I'm also on the Programming Committee for the Bookmark Festival of Books, so I'm representing both organizations that have brought Dr. Harkness here to speak with us today. Um, if you have not heard of Bookmarks, um, please take a brochure as you go out. You can come. This is a free book festival in downtown Lincoln Salem that takes place tomorrow. You can see Deborah again if you want to, yeah. and lots and lots of other authors. Um, so, so um, please take one of these if you want more information. Um, Deborah's here as part of the Bookmarks Authors in School program. One of the things Bookmarks does is place authors in local educational institutions from <coughs> preschool up through college. Um, so that's why we have her here um, to speak with us today. Um, there will be, uh, just to, I'm just going to give you a little business information um, and then I'll turn things over to our history um, faculty member Monique O'Connell who introduced Dr. Harkness, but just to let you know, there will, um, uh, Deborah will be signing books afterwards. There are books for sale. If you didn't bring your own copies, there are books for sale out in the hallway. Um, you can purchase one, and then she will be, um, will be signing here. Um, as you're waiting for the book to get signed, you can take a look at some of the materials that we have on exhibit, which relate to both uh, Deborah's book and Charlie Lovett's book, who was here earlier this week, who some of you came to hear, and who will also um, be at bookmarks. Um, and if you have any questions about the facilities, please feel free to ask me. So, um, welcome, and welcome to Monique and Deborah. I'll let you. Well, thank you so much. I'm just thrilled to be able to introduce Deborah Harkness, as I'm a historian of early modern Europe myself, and have been a fan of both her scholarly and her fictional work um, since it came out. We were just talking earlier about the moment when I opened up the book and started reading it and saw Diana Bishop go into the Bodleian Library and get angry because someone was sitting in her seat. And I immediately knew that this was written by someone who had spent a lot of time in the archives <laughs> because I had the parallel experience in the Venetian archives where I can tell you exactly where my seat is. Even though I'm not there right now, nobody better be seated. <laughs> right. um, so it's a really wonderful opportunity to be able to bring someone who, who has these expertises in the field of history, but also has, has done such a wonderful job of bringing the world of doing history into a fictional realm. Um, so as you all know, Dr. Harkness is a historian of science and medicine who specializes in the Renaissance and particularly in Renaissance England. And her scholarly work examines how the study of the natural world moved from medieval universities to elite libraries, sort of like this one, and court settings, and then to the, to the homes and cities of, of early modern Europe. And one of the things I was talking to my students who had the opportunity to meet with Dr. Harkness, and I was telling them that one of the things they immediately assume, and their roommates tell them, is that science is something that takes place in the laboratory, either in corporate settings once they've left the university, or in university, universities and um, campuses like this one. And what I find so wonderful about Dr. Harkness's work is that it opens up a world where science took place all over the place. It took place in kitchens and people's bathrooms and their sheds. And it was really something that was integrated into daily life. Um, and so through this, this space-based analysis of the beginnings of the scientific revolution, we really come to understand the, that the boundaries we sometimes think of between the scientific and the magical worlds of knowledge weren't actually that firm in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Um, and so this theme of linking natural philosophy, alchemy, magic, and theology into a single world runs through her fictional and non-fictional works, as some of, you, some of you know. Her first book, John Dee's Conversations with Angels, Kabbalah, Alchemy, and the End of Nature, which was published by Cambridge, studies the library of the 16th century natural philosopher and spiritualist John Dee in order to better understand his seemingly incongruous interest in mathematics, astronomy, and magic. Um, and sort of places him in a 16th century context. And her second book, The Jewel House, Elizabethan London and the Scientific Revolution, which was published by Yale in 2008, and which has won more prizes than I can list here. And I see some of you have it, so you sort of know how wonderful People it is. People have The Jewel House? <laughs> I love right you, that's so nice. <laughs> wow, okay. 
So, so this examines a wide variety of scientific practitioners in early modern London who mix the theoretical with the practical. And it really opens up a wonderful vista onto what it was like to be a practitioner of the natural sciences in early modern London. Um, and so if you're interested in, in this topic, it's really a wonderful book to pick up. Um, and, and it argues that the practices were necessary to shift the study of nature out of the library and into the laboratory. So again, questioning and sort of thinking about the where, where knowledge is made, the sites of making knowledge. But of course, the reason we're all here is for her fictional work, um, which you're probably all familiar with, so I will not um, go on. Um, but thank you very much for being here, and there you go. Thank you, Monique. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Yes, so thank you, friend. Thank you also to the staff of the library, especially staff of special collections and rare books, who really did put together an amazing exhibition. So if you were in, waiting around afterwards to, to see me or have a moment, I highly recommend looking at it. And also thanks to all of you, because let's face it, this is about the most perfect weather-wise day you can ever imagine and I lived in Durham for a year uh, uh, in, in the about in 2004 and um, days like this were very very precious and you didn't necessarily want to be indoors during them so I thank all of you you for for showing up so I'm here to talk to you about the All Souls trilogy and where we are and how we got here and all of those good things I will I want to share one thing with you with you which is that it was on this very day in 2008 that I asked myself the question, if there really are witches and vampires, what do they do for a living? I sat in my hotel at breakfast and I thought, it's five years to the very day that I began a discovery of witches. Um, so, uh, what is, and what a, a wonderfully, strange and unexpected time I've had um, since that moment. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about witches and a little bit about shadow and a little bit about this whole process of, of finishing off the trilogy. And then I'm going to leave lots of time for your questions at the end um, because you always have more interesting things to talk about and say than I do. And then we'll, we'll sign some books. So as I said, September I was in 2008, I was celebrating my mother's 70th birthday with my family in Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. And uh, no one had actually told me it was the rainy season. And so I had come to Puerto Vallarta with one bathing suit, a pair of flip flops, and literally nothing else because I was going to spend the whole time outdoors on the beach. Um, but it didn't actually happen that way because it was monsoon like rain in, in Puerto Vallarta. And, uh, as we got off the plane and I looked at the monsoon like rain, I, I said, well, let me just stop at the bookstore and get a book. And I went to the bookstore and I had been working on the Jewel House and so had not gotten out a whole lot in the previous few years, except to lovely rare books rooms like this one. And um, everywhere I looked, there, was, there were black covered books with red tulips or ribbons or chess pieces on them. <laughs> and, and I thought, what is that? Why is it there are only four books in the in this whole bookstore? And then there was like one little wall that had you know a whole selection of books about werewolves, angels, fallen angels, devils, demons, shapeshifters, weird cats, you name it on it. Um, and I thought. What, what, is, what is going on? And of course, my 13-year-old niece piped up and was like, it's twilight. And I said, what's that? Um, and she sort of explained it to me. And I left the airport thinking, OK, this is just very strange. Because I study the 16th century and their interest in things like magic, witches. And I have a very hard time convincing my students they have anything in common with people who lived in 1550, but that airport bookstore in Puerto Vallarta, <laughs> anybody from 1550 would have totally felt at home in that bookstore. They would have been thinking, this is great. This is what I want to know. I want to know if my neighbor is actually not just a physician, but also part of the living dead. You know, this would have been a bit important thing to know. 
And so I didn't get any books because I just thought, this is what I, I'm on vacation. This is like what I do for my job. I'm not reading any of this stuff. And, um, and I, the more I talked to my niece and heard what it was about, you know, I, I was, I have to admit, utterly transfixed by the notion that if you had immortality, you would spend it in high school. <laughs> um, and I started thinking about, like, about the implausibility of this, which is why, in my very history of science way, I study how people look at the world around them and figure out their place in it, how they build systems to explain what they see and what they don't see. I started with these sort of questions. Well, OK, say my research subject were right, and there really are witches and all of these supernatural creatures around today. And, and presumably, they didn't die out, but they're still around. If they're still around, where do they live, and what do they do for a living? And that was where Discovery of Witches started. And I thought at the time, I believed I was thinking of writing a sort of totally angry op-ed piece for a newspaper about you know the modern fascination with these creatures and what it says about us as a people, or something like that. Um, and I, the more I thought about this, and I thought, well, you know, you wouldn't be in high school. And you know, Lexi told me, you know, when his dad's a doctor, I'm like, no, no, no. Vampires are always in hospitals. That's that's not where they would be. Um, and I was thinking about witches, and I was thinking, you know, well, where would witches be? And I thought they'd be librarians. They'd be, you know, they'd want to hang around old books and arcane knowledge, and or they'd be like anthropologists studying different cultures or teachers, you know, and. A whole, I started building a world um, in a very historian of science kind of way, figuring out what the rules would be, how it would work, how it would operate. And I went down to the hotel gift store and I said, Do you have a notebook? Um, and they said, Sure. And so I, know, I don't carry it around with me anymore, but it's about this big. It has a leaping dolphin on it and Puerto Vallarta and a kind of silky tassely bookmark on the side. And it was in that book that I started writing little notes about, you know, like, again, for my op-ed piece, about how ridiculous is it really that we think they would be this and not this. And I was traveling with someone who's an American historian, and I said to her, OK, was anyone in the Salem witch trials, any of them, do you think, did, here in America in 1692, do you think any of them were actually guilty. I mean, do you think any of them were actually practicing any form of magic at all? And she said, well, there's maybe one who might have been practicing magic, because they found this funny little stuffed doll called a poppet in her wall, um, and her name was Bridget Bishop. And I wrote the name Diana Bishop, either out of some kind of altered mental state or just making a total mistake. I wrote Diana Bishop down, and that was the first thing I wrote in this notebook. And the rest, as they say, is history. It was for, I went home. I started working in odd hours, like first thing in the morning and last thing at night. And pretty soon, I wasn't writing an op-ed piece. And I knew this because people were talking to each other, <laughs> which doesn't actually happen in op-ed pieces. And I was like, this is really interesting. It's like my imaginary friends. And I come and I hang out with them. I told no one I was doing this. I finally broke the news to somebody I was doing about four weeks into the process. And they said, that's nice. And I went back. I thought, yeah, that's nice. And I went back to my office and, um, and, and kept writing. And by about Thanksgiving time, I had about 18 chapters of the book. And it was at this moment that I thought maybe I should tell somebody else that I was writing a novel. So I called my agent, who thought I was writing a book on the early years of the Royal Society, <laughs> and, um, and tell him how my progress was on that project. And I said, Sam, that book on the Royal Society? And he said, yep. And I said, I'm writing a vampire novel. And there was <laughs> dead silence on the other end of the phone. And, and Sam, Sam said to me, um, OK. That was literally what he said. This is the longest OK in the world. OK. And I said, do you want to see it? And he said, I think I'd better, don't you? <laughs> and so I sent him the files. And weeks went by, nothing. And I called him again. I said, Sam, just tell me if it's really terrible, because I'll go back to the Royal Society, which is what I'm actually supposed to be working on. And he said, I haven't opened the attachment yet. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, it's going to be terrible. And I know this because 
academics, it's always terrible when you decide <laughs> to write poetry or fiction. It's always bad. And then I'm going to have to tell you it's bad. And from this moment on, you're going to be a frustrated, failed novelist instead of a reasonably good historian. And I said, would you just open the attachment? And then you know, you'll free me from my imaginary friends if it's terrible. And about a week went by, and he called, and he said, I think you should keep going with it. And that was like, it was like I got, I don't know, like a whole snow days or, you know, <laughs> free out, get out of jail passes or whatever. And, um, and I kept on working on this book. So the, the book is, as, as I think probably most of you in the room know, the story of a reluctant witch named Diana Bishop, who is, in fact, the last living descendant of Bridget Bishop, who was the first woman executed for the crime of witchcraft in the Salem witch trials. And Diana Bishop is a reluctant witch because she does not want to go into the family business, except her family business is not law or accounting, but magic. And so she's really created a very kind of orderly, logical world for herself. She's very proud. She studies the moment in the history of science when science, when the skeptical chemist triumphs, it's over in your case, and you know, chemistry takes root, sheds off all of the magical mumbo jumbo from the past. That's what she does. She likes the moment where science makes magic go away. And she goes to the Bodleian Library and she puts in her requests, and out of the Bodleian Library stacks comes a book that as soon as she opens it, she knows there's some kind of magic associated with it. And that even in this place where she relies on her mind and her scholarship, and she's there to celebrate the birth of science, somehow her magic has found her. And she managed, she, she looks at it, she thinks, you know, this is my job, I look at books, it's going to be okay. She looks at it, she sends it back into the stacks, and she thinks her life is going to be exactly as it's always been. But as you and I all know, it takes five seconds to change your life completely. It's always those little accidents that you think are totally insignificant that are the real life changers. And so it is because of that discovery and the gossip surrounding it in the magical and otherworldly world of Oxford, because witches are not alone in the world, of, uh, in the world that I have built, but there are other worldly creatures that include very long-lived, although you can kill them, vampires, and also demons, spelled with an A. Um, and uh, I'm happy to explain why later, if you want to know why my demons have an A in them. Uh, they, they share the world. There's sort of four species that are humanoid in appearance, which is vampires, demons, and us, the, the, the poor humans. And uh, when she goes back to the library after returning this book to the stacks, in walks a very old vampire named Matthew Claremont, who is a scientist and who, unlike Diana, knows science never made magic go away, and has her number from the minute he looks at her, knows that this is a woman who is just telling herself all kind of stories about what she is and who she's not and how the world really works. And the stories really follow Diana and Matthew's adventures as they try to discover more about this very strange live book in the Bodleian Library um, that Diana has unwittingly called up and the sort of chain of events that comes off of that. And also, as they get to know each other and against all kinds of cultural prohibitions, fall in love um, and just decide to throw in their lot with each other. So. The book, um, the, the books actually, Discovery of Witches and Shadow of Night, are really my attempt to build a kind of coherent world where these creatures might actually exist, and also to imbue them with what I think is really powerful um, in my life as a scholar, which is the world of ideas, very special places like this one, um, where ideas are sort of held, um, which are really going extinct. You know, libraries are under an enormous amount of threat. I always sort of wonder if I'm going to wake up and there aren't going to be any the next day. Um, there's lots of discussions about where are books going. And I just can't imagine a world in which somehow those things that I organized my whole life around wouldn't actually be there. So I infused as much of my love of books and history and libraries and research into my fiction as I possibly could with the surprising result that um, 
many of you are much more interested in the the real history that might have informed these books than you actually are in the fictional story that I'm telling, which again is like if if you were all my undergraduates, I would be the happiest professor alive. Because <laughs> this is actually quite hard for me to get students to appreciate. You know, that really, like, what really happened in the class is really cool. And, and knowing it is powerful. Knowing it gives you a kind of power. Uh, and so for a teacher, um, one of the most striking things about the experience of writing this trilogy has just been the sheer excitement about the past and about research and about rare books that. I have unwittingly caused by asking if vampires were around, what did they really do for a living? And while that's true for Discovery of Witches, which is the first chapter in Matthew and Diana's adventure, it's even more true for the more recent title um, that came out in the summer of last year and came out this, this spring in paperback, which is Shadow of Night. So um, Shadow of Night, which is I think I will you know sort of spend a little bit more time on than I did on Witches, Shadow of Night um, is a book that is really my love letter to the period of study, period that I study. It's not actually Diana's period of study. People are always like, well, you know, she's going back to the time she knows best. Actually, she's not. You know, she's going back to a period that's sort of 130 years before what she studies. So it would be like taking a World War I historian and plunking them in the American Revolution. We wouldn't necessarily think, they'd have like all the answers on how to load a musket because they were a World War I historian. But it's my period. <laughs> so I got to put Matthew and Diana um, back in time um, because one of Diana's newly discovered magical abilities is an ability to travel in time. And as they're looking for answers about this book, Matthew and Diana decide in part to go back to the past so they can find out more about this mysterious Bodleian volume called Ashmole 782. Now, just a little bracket about Ashmole 782. For those of you who don't know, Ashmole 782 is a real book. It really exists. It's really missing. Um, and it's the one book in the Bodleian's collection I wanted to look at and wasn't able to. So when I was writing my book, I was like, you know, how did I get put that book that I could never see because it was lost in Discovery of Witches? They still haven't found it. I always get little <laughs> updates from them, like, still missing. Um, <laughs> and a lot of people now request it. They're like, no, we don't. We really don't know where it is. Um, but uh, I don't know what they think is going to happen. Like, blue fun, you know, blue thunder clouds are going to appear or something like that. But um, but what I what I when I put Ashville 782, this source of frustration in a discovery of witches. I, was, I actually do a fair amount of that, putting things that frustrate me as a scholar or annoy me as a scholar into my fiction and kind of, I guess it's like, you know, I get to work through them, as what a psychologist would say. So Shadow of Night, Shadow of Night is actually the title of a real book, as is Discovery of Witches. But Shadow of Night is the text that I wrote my master's dissertation on. It's a poem written in 1594 by a man named George Chapman. And George Chapman, as some of you are smiling, looking at me like, George Chapman, I wrote my master's thesis on his poem, Shadow of Night, and it was dedicated to a man named Matthew Royden, who was the bane of my existence when I was a master's student. Because Matthew Royden, it was, he was the person I could find nothing about who I needed to know something about. And what was so aggravating about Matthew Royden was that he knew everybody, best friends with Walter Raleigh, wrote the elegy when Sir Philip Sidney died, was a spy of Queen Elizabeth I, um, knew George Chapman, that's why the book was dedicated to him, friends with Thomas Harriet, one of the early pioneers of the telescope. How can you not find out anything about a man with this kind of arsenal of friends and background? But it was literally like he just was this little shadow that flitted across the stage and he drove me crazy because I, you know, I was writing a master's thesis. I needed to footnote things and there was nothing to be had. So um, one of the things when I, my imaginary friends were coming to visit me way back in Discovery of Witches, why is Matthew Claremont Matthew Claremont? It's Matthew Claremont because of Matthew Royden. I knew he was going to be Matthew Royden 
from the minute I started thinking about vampires. Because when I thought, what, what are vampires like? I thought, they'd be like that annoying Matthew <laughs> Royden. They'd be these sort of weird shadowy folks who like know everybody and know everything, but you can never pin them down long enough to actually figure out what's really going on with them. And I thought, that's a vampire. Matthew Royden definitely you know, fits my profile being a vampire. So I built all of Matthew's personality, how he behaves, what he's interested in, the kind of friends he has, on the real Matthew Royden, the very shadowy 16th century figure who is friends with all these men. Somebody said to me, why does Matthew have to know all these famous people in the 16th century? It's like the Forrest Gump of vampires, which is one of my favorite things anybody's ever said to me. And I said, it's not my fault. He, Matthew Royden really did know all those people. And, um, you know, and, and so it's, I, I didn't do that. It wasn't like me stuffing the character list with the rich and famous. Matthew Royden was always Matthew Claremont. He always had those friends. And that's part of what helped me to shape the whole character. So you guys, for those of you who love Matthew Claremont, you've actually been falling in love with Matthew Royden, poet and spy, all the way since the beginning, because that was sort of my model for what a vampire could be. So Shadow of Night ends up being this kind of meditation um, on history, on, um, on the 16th century, about the way that the 16th century was both really troubling in some ways, but also kind of fascinating in other ways in terms of what it could teach a 21st century scholar and witch about the world. What could, and so I, one of the things I really wanted to do in Shadow was to figure out what kind of things could Diana learn in the 16th century she could no longer learn today. How to do alchemy. I mean, there are some people doing alchemy, but not as they were then. For one thing, we've totally messed up alchemy by having pure metals. They didn't in the 16th century. So things were always exploding and turning blue because there was copper in it or something else. We can't get the same things to happen in a laboratory setting anymore. Um, so imagining that, imagining what kind of magical lore she might have had access to in the 16th century she wouldn't have today. So it was, it was intended in a part to be a sort of a humbling experience for a scholar to go back to the past and realize just how much the past could teach you, which is what I'm always telling my students, right? The past can teach you things the present you know, isn't yet able or ready to teach you. And I really wanted to make that true. Um, one of the things I also wanted to, to, to do was to make Diana sort of reflect on what it is like to be a modern woman as opposed to what it was like to be a woman, say, before feminism, which is actually quite recent um, in, in our world. And so I just want to read um, a part of Shadow of Night um, which, in which I tried to uh, play with this. So this is a, um, what this happened is Diana and Matthew have gone back to the 16th century to Halloween night in 1590, and they have plunked right into the middle of what Matthew describes as a, a, just a little group of friends getting together, like, like they do every year, and turns out to be the School of Night. This illustrious group of intellectuals, Walter Raleigh, Thomas Harriet, Christopher Marlowe, um, all of whom were friends with this guy named Matthew Royden. Um, Christopher Marlowe seems to have been his particular friend. When Christopher Marlowe was assassinated in a tavern in Deptford, in, during the inquest into his death, they actually would ask people, they said, do you know what happened in that tavern? And people would say, we have no idea. But if you could find Matthew Royden, he would know. But he's totally disappeared. We have no idea where he is. So that was sort of, you know, they get, she gets plunked into this world, a historian who finds out, you know, she's sharing a house party with not just Christopher Marlowe, she had a heads up about, but Walter Raleigh and all these other people. And what happens is, is that, of course, uh, you know, when you go back home, there aren't, I don't think there are many students in the room right now, but, you know, if you remember back when you went home in college and you went, you reverted to all of your old bad habits, okay, you'd, you'd find yourself, like, shouting, Mom, and, you know, can you get me potato chips, and, like, leaving your lawn... Okay, right, exactly. So I thought that's what kind of would happen if you went back to a life you'd led before. You revert to your old habits. Well, for Matthew, what that means is he reverts back to being a 16th century gentleman. The only problem is he's got a 21st century witch for a wife who is 
somewhat shocked, not only to find herself eating dinner with Walter Raleigh, but also uh, what's happening to her husband. So the pa passage I'm going to read you is a passage that comes about because Matthew's friends decide that the perfect thing to do for Diana is to just find a witch and bring her on down to the house for a little chat with Diana. Um, and this is something that Diana thinks, for excellent reasons, just might be fraught with peril. So that's what I'm going to read. <laughs> the School of Night had been eager to help Matthew find the creature. Their suggestions illuminated a collective disregard for women, witches, and everyone who lacked a university education. Henry Percy thought London might provide the most fertile ground for the search, but Walter Raleigh assured him it would be impossible to conceal me from superstitious neighbors in the crowded city. George Chapman wondered if the scholars of Oxford might be persuaded to lend their expertise, since they at least had proper intellectual credentials. Tom Harriet and Matthew himself gave a brutal critique of the strengths and weaknesses of the natural philosophers in residence, and that idea was cast aside too. Kit Marlowe didn't believe it was wise to trust any woman with the task, and drew up a list of local gentlemen who might be willing to establish a training regimen for me. It included the parson of St. Mary's, who was alert to apocalyptic signs in the heavens, a nearby landowner named Smithson, who dabbled in alchemy and had been looking for a witch or demon to assist him, and a student at Christ Church College who paid his overdue book bills by casting horoscopes. Matthew vetoed all of these suggestions and called on Widow Beaton, Woodstock's cunning woman and midwife. She was poor and female, precisely the sort of creature the School of Night scorned. But this, Matthew argued, would better ensure her cooperation. Besides, Widow Beaton was the only creature for miles with purported magical talents. Summoning Widow Beaton may not be a good idea, I said later, when we were getting ready for bed. So you've mentioned, Matthew replied with barely concealed impatience, but if Widow Beaton can't help us, she'll be able to recommend someone who can. The late 16th century really isn't a good time to openly ask around for a witch, Matthew. I've been able to do little more than hint at the prospect of witch hunts when we were with the School of Night, but Matthew knew the horrors to come. Once again, he dismissed my concern. Oh, the Chelmsford witch trials are only memories now, and it will be another 20 years before the Lancashire hunts begin. I wouldn't have brought you here if a witch hunt were about to break out in England. Matthew picked through a few letters on the table that Pierre had left for him. With reasoning like that, it's a good thing you're a scientist and not a historian, I said bluntly. Chelmsford and Lancashire were just extreme outbursts of a far more widespread concern. You think a historian can understand the tenor of the present moment better than the men living through it? Matthew's eyebrow cocked up in open skepticism. Yes, I said bristling, we often do. That's not what you said this morning when you couldn't figure out why there weren't any forks in the house, he observed. It was true, I'd searched high and low for 20 minutes before Pierre had gently broken it to me that the utensil was not yet common in England. Surely you aren't one of those people who believe that historians do nothing but memorize dates and learn obscure facts, I said. My job is to understand why things happen in the past. When something occurs right in front of you, it's hard to see the reasons for it, but hindsight provides a clearer perspective. Then you can relax, because I have both experience and hindsight, Matthew said. I understand your reservations, Diana, Calling on Widow Beaton is the right decision. Case closed, his tone made clear. In the 1590s, there are food shortages, and people are worried about the future, I said, ticking the items off on my fingers. That means people are looking for scapegoats to take the blame for the bad times. Already, human cunning women and midwives fear being accused of witchcraft, though your male friends may not be aware of it. I am the most powerful man in Woodstock, Matthew said, taking me by the shoulders. No one will accuse you of anything. I was amazed at his hubris. I'm a stranger, and Widow Beaton owes me nothing. If I draw curious eyes, I pose a serious threat to her safety, I retorted. At the very least, I need to pass as an upper-class Elizabethan woman before we ask for her help. Give me a few more weeks. This can't wait, Diana, he said brusquely. I'm not asking you to be patient so I can learn how to embroider samplers and make jam. There are good reasons for it. I looked at him sourly. Call in your cunning woman, but don't be surprised when this goes badly. Trust me. Matthew lowered his lips toward mine. His eyes were smoky, and his instincts to pursue his prey and push it into submission were sharp. 
Not only did the 16th century husband want to prevail over his wife, but the vampire wanted to capture the witch. I don't find arguments the slightest bit arousing, I said, turning my head. Matthew clearly did, however. I'm not arguing, Matthew said softly, his mouth close to my ear. You are. And if you think I would ever touch you in anger, wife, you are very much mistaken. After pinning me to the bedpost with frosty eyes, he turned and snatched up his breeches. I'm going downstairs. Someone will still be awake to keep me company. He stalked toward the door. Once he'd reached it, he paused. And if you really want to behave like an Elizabethan woman, stop questioning me, he said. So, you know, that's the reality of living in the 16th century. I get notes from people saying, couldn't she actually have like been more, uh, more surprised that she had to use a chamber pot or that her clothes weren't waterproof? And I'm like, no, actually historians really do get that part. But what it's harder for us to imagine is like what it was like psychologically for people of the time to have to, to live under really very different rules. And to imagine just how jarring it would be, it doesn't matter if you know there are forks or not. This is not what's going to be hard about living in 1590. What's going to be hard about living in 1590 is knowing whose eyes to meet, whose eyes not to meet, how to talk, how to walk. I had a college professor. Harold Garrett Goodyear, who, said, who made us all in his Western Civ class take Renaissance dance for a day. We were like, what is this about? And he said, if you can't understand how they moved in the Renaissance, you'll never understand the Renaissance. And so we were all hopping around and doing brawlins and pavans in, in Western Civ. But he was, he was absolutely right. You had a completely different sense of what it would have been like. We were wearing modern clothes. How you did it wearing 40 pounds of gear, I have no idea at all. <laughs> So those are the things that would trip you up. That's where you'd get caught. You know, one of the famous things we know about spies in World War II, American spies in World War II, you know this, it's which, which hand they put the fork in. That's how you could tell, and because it, it's a very hard behavior to unlearn, that instinct to pick up a, a, a fork with your, with your right hand instead of your left. So I, that was part of what I tried to do in, in Shadow of Night, was to, present a fictional view of the past, but one that seemed real to me as a scholar in that period, and that had some of the real problems and complexities of the 16th century life that, again, are not about forks and chamber pots and corsets, fascinating though that all may be. It would have been about how you related to other people, what they expected of you, and what you had a right to expect from them as well. And of course, it's nowhere more important in this relationship than what it does to the relationship between Diana and Matthew. Someone asked me, you know, didn't it bother you to make Diana so, you know, so weak in the 16th century? And I said, I don't think she's weak at all. I said, I actually think she went into the 16th century having like no sense at all of like real life politics or how the, you know, how to operate in the shark infested waters at all. When she gets out of the 16th century, she knows all of that kind of stuff. And she now has got a sort of 16th century survival toolkit that is going to be pretty formidable if, again, you take her out of the 16th century and drop her in, say, 2010, um, which is what's going to happen. And so with that, we talked about, so book three. Where is book three? What is book three? Are you even working on book three, as some people <laughs> say to me? So here's the real deal. Shadow of Night was published last July. I then spent three months promoting it, which means that I dragged my exhausted body back home at the end of September and promptly slept for about three weeks. Um, I, and I started writing. And then, you know, there, I do have a couple of other things that I'm doing, like living, so I have to go to the grocery store occasionally. Um, uh, there was also, you know, a movie being worked on that they actually wanted me to be involved with, so that took some time. I do have, still have students, even though I wasn't teaching at the moment. And I started writing, you know, round and about in January when all things were said and done. This is still a pretty rapid turnaround. These aren't actually tiny books. Um, and for those of you who've read them, what you know is they're not actually like, you know, formulaic. In, in, they have elements that are very formulaic, all books do, but there's a lot 
of stuff that you can't actually just sort of like think, oh yeah, I'll do what they did in that other book over there and everything will be fine. Um, and so I've been writing steadily since January. I am not finished yet. But that's okay. Because actually when I wrote Shadow, I wrote it basically over a nine to 12 month period. I wrote Discovery in nine months. So we're totally on target for me to finish up in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> but in, and, and we are, we really are. Um, but until I actually finish, for reasons that have to do with really hard won experience, the publisher is not going to set a press date. Why is this? You could not count on your hands and toes, and everyone in this room's hand and toes, the number of authors who said, it'll be done in a week, who still have not handed their book in. Okay? <laughs> so they're not going to set a whole publicity and marketing machine, reserve the press. Reserve the people who make the cardboard boxes and print the cardboard boxes. Reserve the warehouse space until I actually write the end on this and hand it to the editor. So that's why I, somebody said, why are you holding it out? I'm not. I swear to you, I'm not. <laughs> I don't know when this book is going to come out because I can't actually tell you exactly when I'm going to finish it. Um, like I said, we're on schedule for it to be finished. Nobody's you know, in any kind of panic. but. Um, but I know it feels like a long time for you guys. I will point out that you have not waited as long, you know, I, it, Shadow came out 15 months, longer than that, 17 months after Shadow. Um, and Shadow did come out July of last year. So you're still not at 17 months yet. Um, you will probably be a little bit past that when, when book three comes out, but still. So we're like in final negotiations over a title. Because guess what? I don't get to pick the title. I get to recommend the title. They hated A Discovery of Witches. Hated it. They said, the first thing I said was, we'll buy your book, but you're not having that title. And I said, but there's a reason. It's a real book title. It's fun. You have to have it. <laughs> and they argued with me for seven months. And I said, OK, what do you suggest? And nobody could come up with a suggestion, so I won. <laughs> um, they loved Shadow of Night. But you know, so it's out there. In, in, in all of Manhattan, the entire publishing industry goes on vacation on August 4th, and they come back after Labor Day. So there's all of these people getting on their email now in New York and saying, the title thing, we should do that now. Um, so I, I should have a title. Um, I should have a, a, a cover. All, weirdly, I will have a title and a cover long before we have a publication date because it takes so long for the art department to get photo clearances and all this kind of thing and for them to actually print it. Um, and you know, writing book three has been a really interesting challenge because what I love, it turns out, about writing is people making up new people, putting new people in new places with new things happening. And when you're writing the end of a trilogy, you actually have to tie up all the previous things you've already put into place. So it's a little like the difference between like flying an airplane or building a model airplane. Um, one is about you know, soaring in flight and imagination, and the other one is about taking little tiny pieces and gluing them with super glue and holding them with tweezers and making them all fit together. And that's what it's kind of been like. And for the first sort of six weeks, I was just angry all the time. Because I was just, I, I was like, no, I want, you know, I want a new vampire. I want, you know, <laughs> let's go to it. Let's go. I, for, for the longest time, let's go to the Ambrosiana. Let's go to a new library, um, you know. And, um, and, and obviously, you can't really do that, or this series will never end. And you've all had your experience with those. The trilogy that turns into like nine books, I now completely understand why this is. It's because the authors say, but no, we could do something new. Um, but I, you know, when I started writing this book, this series of books, it was supposed to be one book in three parts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Because you know what? That's a really good formula. And it's worked for a long time. <laughs> and so I got like up to page 400 of the beginning. And I thought, OK, it's not going to be one book. And that's when it became three books with a beginning, a middle, and an end. You know, I just sort of took it and did that. So um, it's always been three, and there was no way I was going to do that to you and sort of say, guess what? Is this now a six-book series spanning the globe? No. We're going to finish this series in book three. 
um, as God is my witness, as Scarlett would or Hera would say. So, um, so that and that has really been an interesting challenge for me, both a, as a writer, um, but it's turned out to be like a huge amount of fun because it's like you get to rediscover for yourself all of those things that you buried in the books, um, and now can go back and go, oh, 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 I know what I'm gonna do. And you, you go reach into book one and pull something through and plunk it into book three. So I, it's ended up being this weird process where instead of doing like outside research or imagining new things, I've actually gone back to my own writing. Siobhan experienced this with me at lunch. I, was, I know where this, I know I wrote this. It's in this book somewhere. Where is it? Um, when I was looking for one of the passages. But you get to go back to your own work and treat it like your source base and think, I can do fun things with that. Maybe this isn't so awful after all. So I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. Um, I think you're going to be happy with the blend. Um, because really, the other thing that's really strange, I don't know how many, I can't remember now how many chapters each of these books have. But really, book three is sort of the 44th chapter of A Discovery of Witches and the 44th chapter of Shadow. Because you've got two storylines coming together. And so that presented its own really interesting, it wasn't enough to just take you to the next chapter of Shadow. I also have to resolve all that stuff from Discovery that we're still waiting on, like science, which is it's pretty hard to do genetic research in 16th century England, it turns out. So, um, so I, think, I, I think and hope you're going to be um, happy with it. So at that point, I'm just going to stop, and I'm going to see if you guys have questions, because you always do, it's been my experience. Um, and, um, but I want to also just thank you again for your attention and for coming out here to Wake Forest today. So, who's got questions for the professor? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I love, it's always the student in the front row who's got the question. <laughs> Yeah, what I try very hard not to do, for anybody who didn't hear, it's about what, you know, how I navigate these lines of what is re true or what at least historians think is true versus what's fiction and what's possible. Um, I try never to include anything in my books that I know to have not happened. Why are you in Prague in the spring of 1591? Because I suddenly realized, to my horror, that Matthew Royden was in Prague in April of 1590, March of 1591. And I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> you know, I was having a perfectly fine time in London, and I'm looking over, and I'm thinking, he was in Prague. And then I thought, it's like my first book all over. I've got to go deal with John D. and Edward Kelly, because he actually, what he was there to do was report back on Edward Kelly to Queen Elizabeth, as he was his, her spy. So that was his job, I thought. Okay, I guess John D. and Edward Kelly are going to be in this book. And, um, and so there are things that I kind of have to do because I know that's what happened. And they actually, I feel kind of sometimes like I'm playing pinball, where like there's just, it's just these parameters that I sort of have to walk, go between. And it's okay, even though there are those horrifying moments when I think, oh no. Um, when it comes, but then there's a flip side to it, which is that as a historian, this is what I was talking to Monique's class about, as a historian, there are all kinds of things I believe 100% were actually true. And I can't put them in a single scholarly article or book because I don't have anything to reference. I've read around, you know, with Matthew Royden, like well, who I think he really was and where I think he really went. You know, I have all kinds of theories, but I can never actually in my history share those because I have, don't have sufficient evidence to support them. It all goes in here, <laughs> right? So everything that I know in my heart but don't have evidence for, I just plunk in here. And, and with the result that there's ways in which, you know, I actually think the portrait I drew of London in Shadow of Night is more accurate than the one I drew in the Jewel House because I could put the things that I kind of knew and sensed but could never prove. And that's huge amounts of fun.
because um, as you know, any discipline has boundaries to it, and that's you know the boundary of you don't get to make stuff up. I get to make stuff up as a novelist. That's pretty cool. Um, so I like that part a lot. Great question. Yes. Yes, you can ask too. <laughs> won't I won't answer that one. He's very, very, very old. <laughs> yeah. No, I well, it, for good reason. Yeah. Um, and have you written anything that's made you cry? All right. So I know. <laughs> ha, is there anybody in the room who hasn't read Shadow of Night? One person. Probably it's hard. It's it's hard. It, we're gonna we're now gonna talk about something that happens that if you are very allergic to spoilers, you want to you know this is the la 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 moment. It's kind of hard once the hard okay once the hardback and the paperback have come out. It's pretty hard for me not to talk about the books that you know people people want to talk about. So um, my inspiration for Philippe de Clermont. Um, all I when I was thinking about Philippe de Claremont, I had a blank piece of paper and there was one word written on it, hero. And all I knew about him was that Philippe was the archetypal hero of, of myth. That all the myths in all the world were somehow based on him. And I mean, and then there was a particular subset of myths that I kind of relied on. And then I buried it under a whole lot of Greek and thought no one would get it. And then you all went off and Googled it, and then you all got it. So I won't tell you what that is, but you know, but when you hit the Greek part, um, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and because again, it was like it, it, I wanted him to be. It, Diana and Matthew are so kind of conflicted about who they are and where their power comes from. And I just wanted Philippe to be kind of completely and unambiguously okay with being who he was. Because that's actually, if you look through classical myths, that's who heroes tend to be. The ones who get to that place where they are who they are. They go through this journey, this kind of mythic cycle, and they come out of it being essentially who they always were at the start. Diane and Matthew are like not fully cooked in that department. So I wanted Philippe to be that kind of inspiration. I have a wonderful graduate student named Patrick Wyman, who is a classicist and an early medievalist. And so like, you know, I said to Patrick, I held up this piece of paper and I said, hero. And he was like, OK. <laughs> um, you know, because he's responsible. You know, he goes off and gets articles for me. And he also does the, all the fight scenes with Matthew and Philippe. He like pulled 15th century sword manuals out, read them, and went down to his gym and sparred with the guys in the gym. And they replicated what was in the training manuals to do that fight scene. I mean, he's like, he's great. So actually, there's also somewhat a lot of Patrick Wyman in it, if you ever, and, and, and him. And he's also a lot in Gallo Glass. So if you ever meet this guy, a man named Patrick Wyman, just think, there's a lot of Gallo Glass and Philippe in you. Yeah. Yeah, because Patrick is like, just comes in and it's like, everything's larger than life and fantastic, and guess what I just did last night. So um, when, I won't talk, tell you about uh, Philippe's age, because it gives way too much away. Um, and the other question was about, I've already forgotten, I'm so sorry. R cry. Have I? Yes. <laughs> Basically, anything that has to do with Philippe or Jack makes me cry. You know, so lots of tissues and weeping, and on, you know, we're you know, me me standing in the refrigerator pouring water. Like, what happened? Well, oh my God, they just said goodbye to Philippe. Um, you know, and so yeah, yeah. Uh, so weirdly, it's very, it's almost never anything that has to do with Diana directly, because I just kind of feel like Diana needs to like get with the program and get on top of things most of the time, and so you know, I feel like yeah. You're taken aback by this, and that's a good thing. Let's keep moving. But Jack and, and Philippe, totally different story. So, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Why do I spell <laughs> demon with an A? You are a good student to remember that. Me. So, demon with an A. So, once upon a time in classical times, there were guiding spirits 
So this is pre-Christian times. Guiding spirits, very much like our guardian angels that were called demons, spelled with an A. And they're related to the Roman concept of genius, which was the sort of inspirational inner thing that made you create and inspired you. And we still use genius today, right? Genius is a good thing. Everybody wants to be a genius. People don't want to be demons anymore. So what happened? What happened is in the Christian West, they didn't want people to listen to little voices inside their head. They wanted people to talk to God. And so all those beliefs that came out of the classical world about these sort of guiding spirits, that they wanted to shut those guiding spirits down. So the A drops out, they become demon with an E, they become like red glowing eyes, evil, taking you away from God, which is precisely the argument that the early church made. That if you listen to all of these, you know, mumbo jumbo guiding spirits, you're not listening to God. And it became more and more demonized. I mean, we still use this word. So demons now turn out to be bad. Genius, good. Actually, they're the same thing. And it's kind of what we've done to kind of redo their image. So I like sort of, you know, wanting to get back at Matthew Hopkins, who wrote a witch hunting manual called The Discovery of Witches. Um, that, that's why I stole that title. Or, you know, I have, again, all these sort of scholarly things where I'm like, let's fix that. So that was my attempt to fix that um, and put demons back where they were, which was they were, they, in their origins, there was nothing ever evil about them. That's a myth that you know, humans came up with much later um, because they were afraid. And a lot of my books are about things humans believe because they're afraid and, and what can kind of happen because of it. So, Because I do think in the end, we make the monsters. Um, and the monsters we make, you know, then ha take on a life of their own. Um, so, yeah, so good question. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it was great for me because I it was always going to be set in 1590, and yay, you know. So, um, so for me, it was it was a to it was a late it was wonderful. And like when I first thought about this, the, these three parts of the book, I thought, well, you know, no one's ever going to read this. So what if the first part is like really like fantasy romance, and what if the second part is more like historical? and kind of spy thrillery. And because then I'm like experimenting. And like maybe the third is more so like sci-fi, because there's lots of science in it. There's less science than I thought there was going to be for anybody. You know, we're not going to outer space. Um, but um, we never were, but still. Um, and, and so for me, because it was a total change of setting and tone and everything, because nobody was going to read this, and I was just writing it for me anyway, it was a total delight. To, to write, and I was on very familiar ground. So I didn't have that middle book or second book kind of hump problem, because I was on pretty well-traveled territory. But I know that this can be a problem. It can actually be more of a problem, I think, when people are not writing a series. So for somebody who writes their first book, you know, like Erin Morgenstern, who wrote The Night Circus, right? The minute, the minute she was hit the end, people started saying, so what are you going to do next? I mean, the poor girl, I mean, a poor young woman, I, I'm, I'm confident, didn't have any, you know, what? I'm going to sleep. Um, so, uh, so I think that's where you can really become, it's difficult, especially if you've had a first book that's been quite successful. But that's where I, having a series was, was quite a lucky thing for me. Yeah. OK, well, again, um, because it was all going to be one book, it was always where it is, um, but this, of course, you know, again, you all kind of hate me for that at the, at the moment, because you're like, ah, what happened? <laughs> but, um, but, you know, I thought you were just going to turn the page and find out when I came up with the plot. And it turns out that the plot is really difficult. It's pretty complicated, and it's really difficult to, like, make sudden turns. So if you think about the end, like, can you imagine a better place to stop it than where I stopped it in terms of kind of closure and things like that? So yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Ah, which came first, the manuscript or the library? 
Um, I think it was probably the library. I, because I do think, like really seriously, this is actually, ma libraries really are magical. I mean, they are a place where whole new worlds open up and unexpectedly wonderful things happen. Um, and so this, you know, again, like the, I knew something was gonna happen in a library. The Bodleian just happens to be the library, one of the, the sort of two libraries I know best, and it's a lot more atmospheric than the British Library. Um, so that's, you know, and also I, um, it, you know, I knew that this middle part, it, we were, they were gonna go to London, so you know, why do London twice, and Oxford has all those spires, and it was, and a river. And, and I thought, yes, we're gonna do that. Um, uh, so I put her there, and then, it, I, then I was thinking, okay, like, I need to make up a, a manuscript. And I thought, no, I don't. I can put that aggravating manuscript in it. <laughs> um, and that's where I got that. And actually, the title that appears in the book um, is the title that's in the catalog. So if you actually Google Ashmole 782, you'll find all this stuff about Discovery of Witches and the actual catalog entry that gives you that title and says missing. Yeah. So, second question. I, you know, I think so. I will probably, um, I don't know how, well, scholarly is a totally, totally different egg because it's, it's about um, writing, again, for like my peers. Like I, writing for Monique um, and as opposed to, are, are you, I, I don't know your name. Oh, yeah. Mel. Writing for Mel, who's got the jewel house, but it's not necessarily, I don't think you're a colleague in Renaissance history. I mean, are you, okay, all right, there you go. So, so, but literally, I don't write, for, I don't write for a medievalist even. I write, that's who I write for. Um, and, and I don't know if that's gonna work for me anymore. So I have an idea for two historical books, but they're really meant to speak to bigger sorts of issues. I also have an idea for eight, count them, eight novels. Uh, of different sundry kinds and two television series. So what I actually do, I mean, you know, I'm like, I, I just want to finish this so I can rest. But then uh, you should know like what my to-do list looks like is, is pretty lengthy. So I don't know what I'm going to do next. And that's kind of cool. Like, I, like when I hit send in a couple weeks, I can know uh, what I'm going to do next. So it'll be fun. Question here, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when you were in the chateau, yeah. Nana was in Matthew's private library. Yep. Library. Yep. Can you describe, can you tell me how you determined which books she was going to pull out? Yes. So, what, what, two of the things, the weird things that I did that are probably a little OCD, but oh well, was I actually filled Matthew's wine cellar. So I knew which bottles of wine he would pull off the shelf. And I filled his library. And I did it by, so I know, I have a library list, for, a shelf list for Matthew's library. It's like pages and pages long. And then even now in book three, I'm like, which medieval poems did he read? And I go back to the list, I'm like, oh, that'll work here. Um, and so, uh, because because I really, it really was a sort of sense that, that somehow his experience was in that library, so I needed to have it right. And so I tried to imagine, like, okay, you're you're born in the fifth cent in 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 the sixth century, and you can't read. You're a craftsman. Somebody gives you books. Which books would they give you in the sixth century? That's that's where literally where I started. It was like Dioscorides, you know, Isidore of Seville, all those great medieval insights. And I just went all the way through. Also keeping in mind that as you live older, you know, as we age, we get much better at selecting our friends and spotting interesting things as opposed to just kind of crap. And so I thought, okay, so again, he gets to benefit from that experience. He gets to have not just a library, but a really great library. Because after four or 500 years, you would know when somebody was the real deal and what they were saying was gonna be important um, in probably a way many other people at the time might not have necessarily foreseen. So I just went through that whole library and then when Diana was in that situation, I thought, okay, which are the things that she would notice and pick up on? She's a historian of science, so some of those, the medical and scientific texts stand out. Um, she does English history, so you know, the Shakespeare and the, Gut, you know, the Gutenberg's gonna stand out. And, and just kind of went around the room. And then at some point I realized, you know, there's a very well-known 
um, sort of truth to history, which is that it, at a certain level, if you really want to understand what's going on, you have to follow the money. And so that was where, you know, thinking, well, obviously they've got bank books. <laughs> um, if you've lived this long, um, you can't remember all of that stuff. And so that's where the sort of the ledgers came in. And that's really how, how it still works. And, and I still use, weirdly, the, these documents that I created very early on. I actually have another one, which is for the family library downstairs. Because Isabeau and Philippe, like, you know, basically bodice rippers and page turners. So there's like, there's the whole historical collection of those, you know, the family library downstairs as opposed to, you know, math, more sort of snooty, esoteric stuff upstairs. So great question, great question. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wait till you see what the Bishop House does in book three. <laughs> I, you know, I get very, I'm actually really okay with it. It's, but other people can, I mean, it's really some, it is actually quite shocking what people will send you by email or put on Facebook. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it really, I mean, Charlene Harris has received death threats. And, you know, so, so it is really weird because it really actually in the end is just a book. And I swear you're going to get it, um, you know. So, so anyway, yeah, so the Bishop House is also one of my favorite characters. Uh huh. Uh huh. What um, I Okay. No, 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 no. These are great questions. How does this work? Okay, so what I used was the multiverse theory of quantum mechanics. <laughs> Seriously, that's what I used. What? Okay, there you go. So I did not make this up. Yes, okay. And what the multiverse theory of quantum mechanics essentially means is that it is, is that Every time you make a decision, essentially, I'm going to totally grossly oversimplify, you basically almost, it's like new worlds are created every time you go up to the stop sign and you go left other than right. Infinite numbers of them. And so it, it, it's the, that the universe is kind of in constant flux, is constantly expanding, and the possible outcomes of every single decision, the multiple possible outcomes of not only every decision you've ever made, but every decision anybody's ever made all exist at the same time. So the thing is, this is not Doctor Who style time travel, where there's like, you know, back and forth, this is, or even, you know, multi, it's, it's actually quite infinite. And that um, it's all, like I always think of it as like a river with brand, like many, many tributaries. And so, you know, they left one tributary for another tributary, and they're going to go back and they're going to be a, on a tributary that somehow contains both of the previous two. Because that's how the multiverse theory works. It's very nonlinear. It actually makes no intuitive or logical sense. And yet physicists actually think this is, you know, there's a lot of physicists who think this is actually what's really going on. Um, so it kind of, it's, 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 it's a very weird sort of take on relativity, but it's not that sort of clear time travel. So that's what I used. And that's why Matthew doesn't go anywhere. There's just lots of Matthews. And as for a vampire, that's a lot of choices and a lot of universes that are possible. Um, so that's the time travel. And the other question um, is about, you know, what happens after they leave? So from the very beginning of the book, one of the things that my editor kept saying, you, have, you can't just keep saying this over and over. It has no meaning after a while. This business about vampires don't tell tales. 
you know, it, it was all through witches when you were like, who cares? So they don't, okay, so they don't tell tales. What does that mean? It means they don't tell tales. So that, you know, the human people, Matthew, the real Matthew Royden went off to Scotland to all, to, to, as far as we know, he never returned to England. So he never ever saw any of those people ever again. Any, nobody knew where he was, including like the Queen's justices. So my theory, any male would have had to have gone through like Gallowglass, who's gonna sift anything out. Isabeau wasn't there. The number of secrets Philippe has kept from Isabeau over the years is vast. <laughs> um, you know, and that she's kept from him because when you think about it again, like how do you actually live for thousands of years if what you're constant, if you're being utterly transparent about everything you do to every, you could, you would be, you would go insane. There would have to be moments where you were like, I'm out of here. See you in a hundred years, you know, and I'll, I'll bring you up on like all the most relevant stuff, but you're not getting a blow by blow of the whole thing. So by the time Matthew goes from Scotland to the Netherlands to India, the, the humans have all died, all that's left is the vampires, and the vampires aren't going to tell because, and also because probably Philippe put the fear of God into them. Because, because one of the things, you know, Philippe's worried about is, you know, somehow all, he doesn't have quantum, you know, multiverse theory of quantum mechanics, and he's thinking, time walking, we, we can't do anything that might alter the future. So, you know, we just have to keep this. Matthew, we have to keep Matthew stumbling along. This is why Philippe says, it's going to be really hard not to like tell you you're being an ass because you know as you continue to be you and not you know the you you become as you're becoming this person so that's how how we end up with that um, and that's why it's repeated so many times for seemingly no reason in, in discovery yes ma'am <laughs> To Cambridge? No, because she, she, she asked him, are you going to tell mom? And he says, no. She, she couldn't handle She, No. Right. And can you imagine if your husband showed up and says, guess what? Our, our daughter that we know we're going to have to, like, never see again. And at some point, I, I have. I don't know if I would tell my partner that if I if it happened to me. Either. I mean, there are just these things where you just think, or did he tell her like at the very like at the last possible moment, you know? Or how did he? I mean, he might have said to her things like, "You have to believe she's going to be okay," but. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. 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 So no, I mean he he goes back and and you know this is again, and I, I suspect too if you actually could travel in time, this would be the, the deal you'd have to make. You couldn't actually be going back and say, guess what, you know, <laughs> don't buy the blue house, um, you know. I mean you just couldn't. So so then this is never ever this is hardly ever really dealt with as like a real complexity of, of the situation either. So I think there would have to be this kind of way in which you would respect. It's almost like you know Vegas. You know what happens in 1590 stays in 1590 um, in, in that kind of way. So it, it and it and, and once you kind of start working that way, then everything else becomes logical, right? Then if it's if there's infinite possibilities, if there's not going to be some way in which you suddenly explode because the future you and you, the re, and the current you, know, you and the past you meet on a street, this was all people were so worried. It's like, what if Matthew meets Matthew in London and will they combust? And I was like, no, <laughs> it's not going to happen. Just don't worry about that. So, um, so yeah. So does that. Good. Mm-hmm. 
I never disagree with Einstein and Isaac Newton, and they both believed in it. Right? So, I mean, both of them totally believed that there was more going on, if, if by magic we mean, is there more going on to the world than we can scientifically and logically explain or understand? Absolutely. Am I expecting any of you in the, in the immediate future to call down a lightning bolt? or do, Not so much. But, you know, so much that was once magical is now like long distance communication. Purely magical until, you know, fairly recently. So there's all kinds of things that, you know, again, you know, the, great, the greatest scientists are very humble in the face of what they know is their limited knowledge of understanding how the world works. So I absolutely believe that there's, I, I believe in magic, I believe in science, and I believe in a deity. I don't know how those all can be coexistent in my mind in an equal way, but they are. Um, and so I think that's also part of the sort of world that I'm trying to describe is one where you don't have to make that choice between science or magic or God. Um, but you can somehow, it's okay to have kind of all of them. Um, and you don't have to make those distinctions. So good question. I, if is there one more question, and then I can sign. I'm going to have to take this later. And then if you have other ones, you can ask me in the line. That movie. That movie. <laughs> All right, brace yourselves. Brace yourselves. I have not, I, I like got permission yesterday to say this after five days of negotiation, during which not much writing took place. <laughs> um, I am now the owner of the trilogy again. Um, Warner Brothers bought the rights to the trilogy 18 months ago, which means they also owned the rights to my characters in perpetuity forever, for any purpose or reason, till death to us part. In all gal, it's literally, literally, it says, in all galaxies now known or to be discovered. <laughs> um, it really does. I thought it was a myth, but it doesn't. It, and um, they, for 18 months, they worked very, very hard. Um, to kind of bring to life their, what they wanted to do with the books. And at the end of that 18 months, I think we came to the mutual conclusion that we all just needed to take a little break, a breather. They bought the books when Only Witches was out. So as the story develops, you know, they're like, wait, uh, what was that part? Um, and, and, and so, you know, it, it, was, it was a wonderful, I, I loved working with Warner Brothers. They were fantastic. They treated the project with enormous respect. They worked very, very hard on it. But at the end of 18 months, there was no clear next step that we all agreed on. And at that point, I just thought, you know what? Let's all just have a think before we, we, we go any further than on this. So at that point, the rights revert back to me, so I have them again. And, and I feel, you know, and, and, and there's been lots of interest, and, you know, again in it, and I'm not going to do anything until after book three is out. Just because I just actually think that whoever buys this should probably know the whole thing, what they're getting. Because actually, it really does sort of color things like character to know like where Matthew ends up means that there's certain things you just really can't do to him in book one, even if you want to make him like Superman um, or whoever you know it is. So I just think it's, pro it's better for me. It's better for the people making the film. It's f frustrating, I'm sure. We would all have loved it if what my news was, was they're casting the movie. But, but, but this is OK. And, it's, it's, and I think actually if, if more studios and more authors took that, position, we'd have a lot more happy experiences in the cinema. Um, uh, whereas now I think it's like, you know, things are rushed through and not thought out and lots of violence is done to, to, to books and scripts. And it's a very complicated, what I learned from this was that it is an enormously complicated process to make a movie. I don't know how a single movie gets made. I really, truly don't after my 18 months of experience. So I'm very happy that, you know, we both we are both reached the conclusion at the same time. I'm delighted that I own Matthew and Diana again. 
Um, they're not going to be on a lunchbox near you anytime soon. <laughs> and, um, and, and we just kind of go. I mean, everything that's happened with this whole process from the very beginning has been so completely impossible that I have absolutely no doubt that this will be on a screen um, and that it will be wonderful. But it'll, it may just take a little longer. I haven't broken this to you. Are literally the first people I have told. So, um, so yes. So, but you know what? It's fine. Maybe who knows? Maybe the next person to buy it is it will, will be an Armitage for Claremont person, and then they'll hire Richard Armitage when they buy the book, and it'll be we won't you know all of them can be relieved. So, all right. It's it's like 4:20. So, you so much. Thank, you. thank you.